Dear colleagues, welcome to the session 8A of the 7th EED Congress here virtually in Madrid. The title of this session is Maintenance and Rehabilitation. I am Egbert Beuving, I'm former secretary of IAPA and I'm a little bit retiring at the moment. In this session, we have six very interesting presentations about various subjects. This session was split into two parts, as most of the previous sessions were. So after three presentations, we will have uh, time for questions and answers. And after that, we will start with the second block. Okay, we start with the first session. And the first speaker is Kees Plug. Kees is going to talk about a special porous asphalt eight inlay as a heavy maintenance measure for such a special porous eight surface layer. Kees Plug is a bitumen and asphalt specialist at the construction company Structon Civil Ohms in the Netherlands since 1995. Kees is responsible for the development of polymer modified bindings and new types of asphalt mixtures. Kees studied chemical technology at the University of Twente in the Netherlands and he got his master's degree in 1994. Case, the floor is yours. Thank you for the opportunity to present my paper. My name is Case Plug and I work for Structon Seville, which is a contractor in the Netherlands. Ohm's Products is a subsidiary of Structon and is a producer of polymer, polymer modified binders, ball pipe. The outline of my presentation first, an introduction about the main failure mechanisms of porous asphalt and the expected surface life of porous asphalt. Then an explanation of thin asphalt overlays for porous asphalt, which is a method for repairing old porous asphalt. With the thin overlay system, ID the OPA 8 inlay was developed for this laboratory test were done. And after this, a trial section was conducted on, on motorway A15. I will finish with the result of the trial section after a few years under traffic. The main problem of porous asphalt is raffling due to loss of stones, as can be seen in the picture. This can be due to cohesive failure, this is failure in the asphalt mastic, or it can be due to adhesive failure, this is a failure on the surface of the stones. The problem of raffling can be induced by several factors. The poor mixture design with wrong combination of materials, whether during placing, cold and heavy rain during placing will not help for a good quality. Traffic load, more traffic and heavy traffic will show more damage of the road. Accidents will give mechanical damage and oil leakage. Especially oil leakage will weaken the mastic and cause damage in the long run. After cleaning, there is no damage, but suddenly the asphalt will fail sometime. Porous asphalt OPA 8 in the Netherlands is not a standard porous asphalt, but it was developed for the motorway A15 near Rotterdam in 2013. It was based on OPA 8 in Germany. The noise reduction is comparable to standard Dutch two-layer porous asphalt. And the air void content is 24 to 28% compared to 20% for the standard Dutch porous asphalt, which has not so high uh, noise reduction. The expected surface life is 10 years based on the German criterion, this minimal noise reduction and 12 years based on the Dutch criterion for severe raveling. The porous asphalt uh, OPA 8 has been used in three projects in the Netherlands. The main project was the A15 with 1.2 million square meters and two uh, little projects with the A59 and the A15 A20 connection in 2019. Uh, but, um, as mentioned, that the surface life of porous asphalt depends on several factors. This can be illustrated with the distribution curve of the surface life. As can be seen in the features, the average surface life of a high quality porous asphalt, the blue line is higher than standard porous asphalt, the purple line. But partly the surface life of both products will overlap. So a high quality porous asphalt can fail early and standard uh, porous asphalt can be better than expected, as can be seen in the features. Uh, thin asphalt overlays, for porous asphalt has been placed since 2003. Criteria for such a layer are 
a proper drain drainage of water should be possible, adequate skid resistance, good adhesion with the underlayer, and prevention of deterioration of existing underlying of the porous asphalt. A disadvantage, however, is that a thin overlay only can be placed on the overall road with applying on one road lane is not possible because of the high difference between the two lanes. As this feature shows the principle of the thin overlay, the emulsion is sprayed on the surface and the thin overlay is placed in one single machine pass with a so-called jet spray paper. The open A inlay. So inlay has the same principle as the overlay, only now 27 millimeter of the old surface is milled off and replaced with a new layer. So there's no high difference between lanes. The top layer has been improved further with a heavily polymer modified binder compared to the original OPA-8. As a OPA-8 inlay polymer modified binder, this is a special binder. Uh, with heavily modified PMB. For the standard OPA, a standard uh, polymer modified binder was used. Both binders exceed, however, the German specification for the PMB 40165. Uh, so it's a better quality. To validate the OPA 8 inlay, a test was done to obtain the amount of emulsions, the optimal thickness of the layer, the expected surface lays, and the realized noise reduction. This sheet shows the preparation of the test. First place of old open aid surface were salt from a road section. The section was an old trial section of the open aid itself. The slabs were taken to the laboratory and different amounts of bond coat were applied on top. The new open aid layer was applied on top with a segmented roller compactor in the lab, which is the finished slabs. The porosity was tested with the backer tube measurements. Cores were drilled from the plate and tested according to the tensile adhesion test at 10 degrees Celsius. This picture shows the test uh, setup. The results of the adhesion test, the, the results show that the failure occurs at the interface between the new and the old OPA-8. The best results were obtained with the open 7 kilo square meter amount. It was decided to use this amount as medium amount for the bond coat in the trial section. This sheet shows, uh, shows some pictures on, of the trial section. It was the uh, access ramp of the A15 near Rome eastbound. Uh, the trial section was paved in June 2018. First, the old OP8 was partly milled off and cleaned. After this, the uh, bond coat and the new OP8 was placed with the jet spray paper. This picture shows the results the next morning, and the results uh, look very nice. The test of the trial section, of course, were drilled from the text section and tested the same way as the laboratory samples. As can be seen, the results are almost comparable with the laboratory samples. So the, so the result was satisfactory. This picture shows the results uh, in February 2021, and no disturbing things were uh, visible. So it looks very promising. The conclusion of the test, the test results show that the thin overlay inlay system could also be used as an OPA-8 inlay system. The road surface properties look to be similar to the properties of a totally replaced new OPA top layer. As an envir en environmental measure, partially replacement has a major potential advantage. Only part of the thickness of the top layer is replaced. The system depends on the flatness of the existing top layer. Careful partial milling of the top layer is difficult if the existing layer is not flat. Okay, so thank you very much for your very interesting presentation. It's a very nice technique and it saves a lot of material and it's great for countries that do have a lot of porous asphalt as a service layer like they have in the Netherlands. Uh, if there are any questions or remarks, please use Slido and please start your question by mentioning the name of the speaker you want to like the, the one you would like to address the question to. Then we go to the second presentation. The second presentation is from Martin Arlt. Martin Arlt is going to talk about a regeneration of asphalt using radio waves. 
these radio waves do heat the aggregate, and so they heat indirectly the bitumen. And that means that in this way you can close the cracks that are occurred in existing pavements. Martin Arlt studied civil engineering at the Leipzig University of Applied Science and University of the West of Scotland. In, nine, in 2011, he became site engineer at Strabag AG for civil engineering and road construction. Five years later, so in 2016, he became research assistant at the Leipzig University of Applied Science and the Helmholtz Center for Environmental Research GmbH, who upset. Here he focused on dielectric heating of asphalt with a radio, with a radio frequency at 13.56 megahertz. In 2020, Martin became site manager at Arlt Bauunternehmen GmbH in Germany in the area of civil engineering and road construction. Martin, the floor is yours. Today, I'd like to show how the regeneration of asphalt using radio waves could enhance the maintenance of roads. First of all, I'd like to present what is to understand under regeneration of asphalt. It is basically the combination of the intrinsic healing effects out of the heating of asphalt with radio waves so the bitumen is mobilized and can flow into open cracks. And the extrinsic load application and reshaping of the thermally disformed asphalt to its original shape. So in the end, the asphalt is in the same shape and place as before. So what is to understand under radio wave heating? It is basically the, the same effect like in the microwave oven. You have a direct heat development in the materials, plus the, the advantages of radio wave heating compared to the microwave heating that larger volumes can be heated due to another frequency which is used at 13.56 megahertz. So how will the radio wave heating will heat up the asphalt? In a small experiment, it is shown that stone is placed directly into bitumen and the radio wave heating will work through a radio wave regenerator connected to the specimen wire and matching network and an electromagnetic field will develop in between the, between the live electrode and the grounded electrode so the, just the stone, as shown in the thermal imaging picture in the bottom right corner, will heat up the stone and the bitumen will follow through heat conduction. This is a very good way to heat up asphalt as 90% of the mass will heat up and the bitumen will follow just by heat conduction. So. What experiment were, was carried out to show how the regeneration affects the asphalt? A three point bending test on a four by four by 16 centimeters prisms were carried out. Five regeneration cycles were carried out. And after each a three, point bending, three point bending test, the with open cracks, the prisms were placed in uh, PTFE molds with some wood, wooden frames around them for to heat them up and reshaping as already 
explained in the regeneration process. For each regeneration cycle, um, the maximum flexural strength was calculated. And out of the maximum flexural strength in the regeneration cycle, a regeneration factor to the original maximum flexural strength was carried out. It was cal calculated. For two materials were used for the exper experimental series, one surface coarse material and one weary coarse material. And the specimens were heated up to four different temperatures, 110, 130, and 160 degrees, and also as a maximum surface temperature of 180 degrees, just to see if the temperature will affect the regeneration and the binder aging. The binder aging was investigated for three layers for, e for the specimens. The specimens were cut into a top, middle, and bottom layer to see if the heating is affecting one layer more or another. As reference, uh, RTFOT and PAD tests were carried out. As binder investigation <clears throat> methods, the softening point were used and the uh, FTIR infrared spectrosophy spectronomy was used and there the A1700 after the Belgium Road Research Center method was used. So on the left-hand side picture, you see the regeneration factor for the material A, the surface coarse material, where you see that the regeneration factor in the original three-point bending test is one. And after one regeneration cycle, the regeneration factor is dropping to 0 0.9 roughly and stays there. So you can say that after one, after a macro crack appears in the first three point bending test, the specimen is damaged and it, the, damage, the damage will carry up, will not change much for each regeneration cycle. The effect on the binder aging is basically limited to the RTFOT reference, as you can see on the right side picture. The same you can see for the material B, the bearing course material. There is also on the left hand side picture the regeneration factor, which shows that the material is damaged in the first regeneration cycle by around 10%. So the maximum flexural strength is lowered and will not change much for all five following regeneration cycles. On the right-hand side picture, you can see again that the softening point with uh, shown by the columns and the scale on the left hand side will not change much and not dramatically exceeding the RTFOT short term aging as same as the material A. So if the regeneration of asphalt using radio waves is used for maintenance, it could uh, save the grinding of roads, the transportation to the asphalt plants, and the relaying of the asphalt. So all which needs to be done to regenerate 
and road with help of the radio waves would be heating up the road as it is laying and recompact and reshape the asphalt through to the thermal uh, deformation while heating it up. Thank you very much. And if you have any questions, don't hesitate to ask. Cédric Sauziat is a French professor at the University of Lyon, ANTPE. And ANTPE stands for Ecole Nationale des Travaux Publics de l'État, or in English, the National School of Public Works of the States. Cédric earned his PhD in civil engineering in the field of soil mechanics in January 2003 at INSA, and INSA is the National Institute of Applied Science of Lyon, ENTP. Before Cedric graduated from ENTP in 1997, he earned his master's degree at the same time. The work of Cedric focuses on the behavior of bituminous materials, including binders, mystics, and mixtures, and the structural behavior of pavements. Cedric, the floor is yours. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I will present you a study entitled the Crack Propagation of Bituminous Mixtures Reinforced by Geogrid. First of all, I would like to thank my co-author, Réubert Freire, Hervé Di Benedetto, Simon Pouget, and Didier Le Sueur. This work was made in the framework of a collaboration between University of Lyon and two companies, Afi Texinov and Efage Infrastructure. This work was made during the PhD of Reubert Freire, a Brazilian student. His PhD is entitled Use of Fiberglass Geogrids to the Reinforcement of Bituminous Mixtures Layer. As you may have understood, the idea is to put geogrid in the pavement. We will put geogrid obviously in bituminous mixture, so in bound layer. And this is to avoid different pavement distress. You have it here an example of the geogrid put in place during a work. During the PhD, we study the influence of the geogrid on the behavior of bituminous mixture layers. We study viscoelastic properties, fatigue resistance, and crack propagation resistance. This afternoon, I will only speak about the crack propagation resistance. Concerning the bituminous mixture, it was uh, we study we use uh, BBSG 010, which is a French bituminous mixture. It was made with 20% of wrap, with a 35-50 penetration grade bitumen, and uh, the total amount of bitumen, the total content was 5.35%. About the geogrid, we use a geogrid uh, provided by the company Afitexinov. It's called Notex. So it's, uh, we, we use two types of geogrid with different strengths. One is 100 kilonewton per meter, the other is 50 kilonewton per meter. The mesh opening is 25 by 25 millimeters, and the geogrid was. Uh, coated with bitumen before using. We prepare a slab with these materials using a French wheel compactor. We had five slab configuration. The first configuration is an unreinforced unre slab made with only a simple layer. The second slab is made with two layers but contain no geogrid. At the interface, we have a pure bitumen emulsion. We have used a pure bitumen emulsion as pack coat. Then we have three reinforced slab. The first one is made with a 100 kilonewton per meter geogrid and the same tack coat as the non reinforced slab. The second one uses a 50 kilonewton per meter geogrid, same tack coat. And the last one used uh, 100 kilonewton per meter geogrids, but the tack coat was made with the polymer modified bitumen. 
From this lab, we have cut the rectangular specimen. You have here the scheme of this specimen. You can see the interface geogrid. You can see here the central part and the specimen was firstly pre-notched at the middle, at the center. Above the, the, the notch was two centimeters depth and above the notch, you have nine centimeters of materials and the interface was uh, just at the center. These specimens were put in a four point bending uh, test that we used. For this test, we also have camera to perform digital image correlation. I will show you how we perform after. So during the test, we apply a, displace, uh, a loading at a constant displacement rate. You can see here the displacement in function of time. We obtain the load in function of time also. And we can obtain the deflection from three LVDT sensors. These three LVDT sensors enables to uh, correct the punching effect that could appear close to the load application. The temperature was maintained during all the tests at minus five degrees Celsius. Concerning the digital image correlation, we performed two analyses. The first analysis enables to determine the crack tip height during the test. So we plot uh, virtually uh, some line in the height of the specimen. And along each line, we analyze the evolution of the uh, strain so longitudinal strain, epsilon xx. And to determine when the crack cross the line, we fix a cracking criterion. When the strain reach 1%, we consider that the crack uh, have crossed the line. I will show you an example for line seven at time zero. You can see in black at the bottom of the figure, the strain along the line, which is very close to zero. And after sometimes after crack propagation, you have here the same line and the evolution of the strain along the line. And you can see that the value of 1% was reached uh, in the middle, uh, in the middle of the line. That means that the, the crack cross this line before uh, a little before. And we can do that for all the line in the height of the specimen. The second analysis that we perform is to obtain the strain in function of the height of the specimen. So you have here the height of the obtained from the crack criterion from the first analysis. And we analyze a uh, restrain error around the center of the beam. For each line, we just get an average value of the strain uh, in the central part. With this average value, we can obtain for each line a value of strain. And if we perform this for all the line in the height of the specimen, we have the evolution of the strain uh, in the height of the specimen. You can uh, you can see that uh, you found the compression zone and the tension zone, compression zone at the top of the beam, uh, tension zone at the bottom of the beam, and the crack has uh, just a little propagate. So now I will show you some results. First, the geograde influence uh, on the curve of the load in function of the deflection. Here you have the curve for the unreinforced beam so you have a peak and then after a peak, you have a, a rapid decrease of the load in function of the deflection. The same result, but with the reinforced, uh, uh, the reinforced specimen with a 100 kilonewton per meter grid, geogrid, the same result for the 50 kilonewton per meter grid and the same result for the uh, 100 kilonewton per meter grid, but using polymer modified bitumen. You can see that the difference, uh, there is plateau that appear for after the peak and the geogrid uh, is only mobilized after peak load. 
We can see the second results. So the evolution of the crack tip in function of the deflection. So you have here the uh, classical evolution of the crack tip for the two unreinforced specimen. You, can't, you don't see any uh, real difference. But when we uh, analyze the result for reinforced specimen, you can see that there is a small delay in the crack propagation. You can gain 60% more deflection here for the 100 kilonewton per meter strength uh, geogrid uh, specimen. You have the same results, but only 50% more uh, delay in deflection for the 50 kilonewton per meter strength. And here's the result for the 100 kilonewton per meter strength geogrid with polymer modified bitumen. So from these results, the geogrid uh, show to be a crack retardant for the crack propagation. And you can see that you need higher, higher displacement to apply higher displacement to propagate the crack throughout the beam height. The last result, the evolution of the strain in function of the height of the beam. So we will analyze four points along the, the test. So the point one is at the peak. You can see that the crack uh, didn't propagate yet. And you can see that you have a almost classical evolution of the linear in function of the height of the specimen. Here, you have the crack that has propagated and the linear evolution is only close to the, to the crack and the linear evolution reduces more and more when the crack propagates. We will analyze the difference in function of the reinforcement of the specimen. So you have here the result for unreinforced specimen. So with result with unreinforced specimen, but with an interface. And here you can see what happened for the Geo, uh, the specimen reinforced with the geogrid of 50 kilonewton per meter strength. The same result with 100 kilonewton per meter strength geogrid and the geogrid with uh, polymer modified bitumen. You can see that the uh, nonlinearity behavior happens around the interface during the propagation of the crack. So the conclusion. The presence of the geogrid did, uh, didn't noticeably, noticeably uh, influence the load deflection curve before the load peak. The geogrid only affect the crack propagation after the peak. A force plateau was observed in the reinforced beam as a result of the geogrid mobilization. And I didn't show you here, but uh, higher energy proportional to the grid maximum strength is necessary to crack propagation of reinforced specimen. The geogrid reinforcement delayed the crack propagation from 20% to 60% of beam deflection. And the nonlinearity observed in the curve strain in function of eight during the test was mainly caused by the geogrid influence. And it was also influenced by the interface thickness and the emulsion quantity and quality. So thank you for your attention. I finished my presentation. Cedric, thank you very much for your nice presentation. It's now time for questions. Um, I'm waiting for a case. Yep. I, I suggest to start with a question for case because he was uh, the, the first one. Um, Tobias Balmer raised a question. Case, thanks for presenting your results. You mentioned service life of high quality porous asphalt compared to standard porous asphalt. What are the special ingredients to that high quality porous asphalt that makes it last longer? Yes, uh, special ingredients is a highly polymer modified uh, binder with a special blend of uh, polymers and special additives for uh, better workability. Okay. There was also a question, why did you mill three centimeters or 27? Why did you mill 27 and replace it by 30? Yes, if you mill off 27 millimeters, the surface will be a little bit uneven, and then it is better to place 30 millimeters back. But it will, not be it, it will not no, be higher? No, 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 a little bit higher, but it is not so much. 
Okay. Okay. Then I suggest to, to go to Martin because he also got a lot of questions. Uh, the, the, the most dominant question was from Martin Hügner. And Martin said, heating the aggregates need a lot of energy due to the high heat capacity of the aggregates. How much energy do you need to heat a one ton of asphalt? Which is uh, up to 110 degrees Celsius. You have to unmute. Yep. Uh, this, this is the main problem with the uh, radio wave technology is that you really need a lot of energy to heat large bulks of asphalt. So it is basically compared uh, to the production of, uh, of asphalt in the asphalt plant. I, I know that uh, many, many years ago, they did effect tile sections with microwaves. And I think that also stopped because of the high energy consumption. Uh, yes. And the problem with the uh, microwave technology is that you will not reach any large depth of the asphalt. So there, so you can use the radio wave technology and heat up the whole uh, asphalt course as it is in the road. So this would okay. be a major uh, advantage of the radio wave technology to the microwave. Okay. Uh, then we have also for you, Martin, a question from uh, Jan Voskuilen. And he says, what is the expected speed that micro collects can be healed in the field? In other um, words, can, in other Oh, actually, there there is no no time uh, time limit. You can heat it up as fast as you want. It is the limiting uh, process is or well, the limited resource is the amount of energy you could provide on the road. For a future project, we estimate about uh, a traveling uh, speed like an asphalt uh, uh, yeah the the asphalt laying machine about three meters uh, a minute okay yeah okay um, then we have another question of Jan Verschel, uh, for, for Martin, does the healing ability depend on the degree of aging of the bitumen? Uh, we, we just uh, surveyed a fresh bitumen. So the healing ability is always uh, depending on the age of the bitumen, as the bitumen will age a little bit due to the heating and as and the further it will be aged the further the, the it will not go as good as with uh, fresh bitumen okay good thank you then to, to give Cedric a, a possibility to to respond to some questions and um, the, the highest squad question for Cedric was, um, why did you define minus five degrees Celsius as a test temperature? Thank you, Chaman. Um, it was uh, mainly for tourism, um, minus five degree for, to ensure that the, 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 the behavior of the bituminous mixture was not too uh, plastic and more uh, elastic viscoelastic at least. And uh, the second reason is that uh, um, we have performed a lot of tests at this temperature on other materials and uh, it was easy for us to compare and uh, this is the main uh, two reason. Okay. Then we had another question, Cedric. Um, the question was the slabs are 60 by 60 centimeters. And that means a maximum of 30 centimeters interlocking length if you split it in the middle. Is there enough interlocking length left? 
to build up the maximum capacity of the grid because several suppliers describe a larger minimum interlocking, interlocking length. Um, it's a good question. Uh, we could only perform slabs that were uh, 60 centimeter length, so we could not have more than 30 centimeters interlocking for sure. Mm. But uh, even with this interlocking, uh, I showed you that uh, we, we could see the effect of the grid. So it's difficult to answer and to, <laughs> to uh, not just possible to have some hypothesis about uh, the results that we would get. But uh, even with this uh, interlocking uh, length, uh, then uh, we already see the effect of the grid. OK. Uh, then the, the last question I see from Cedric. Um, would the geograd influence the deflection at peak load if it was put in the lower part of the beam and not in the neutral, uh, not near the neutral fiber? Uh, good question. Uh, what we what, what we saw from our studies is that uh, the geograd only start to work. Uh, if you have enough, uh, how to say, uh, strain applied to it. Otherwise, it will not bring uh, anything to your uh, materials or to your uh, system. Um, so yes, if you put it in the lower part, then maybe we mobilize the heat before and uh, maybe you can ex expect, but I'm not sure that uh, this will happen before the peak load. Um, I'm not sure. Honestly, okay. I need to, to perform tests to, to, to check. <laughs> okay. Um, so I think we have one uh, time for one question for, for Case. Uh, it was from uh, Jose Luis Peña. He said, um, uh, when you mill a part of the former porous asphalt layer, doesn't that limit the drainage capacity of the pavement? by plugging the voids at the interface between the remaining porous asphalt layer and the new layer? Uh, yeah, we have tested that and, and the, the porous asphalt was still uh, porous. So we did the Becker tube test and it was not a problem. So because okay. you, you melt off the same, uh, you put on, uh, you replace the material with the same material with the same openness, with the same uh, air void content, so it is still open. And, and you clean it very well before you apply the layer? Yes, yes, yes. To first to clean it. After milling, you have to clean it, and then you place the new layer on top. Okay. Thank you. Um, okay, there are some questions left, but um, we have to continue with the second part, because otherwise we are not able to be ready before six o'clock. Okay. Case, Cedric and Martin, uh, thank you very much at this moment. And then we go to the second part of this session. And now we go to a different type of presentation. It's also about healing, but in fact, they use a different technique. It is the paper called synthesis and characterization of encapsulated healing agents for asphalt. And it is presented by Francisco Lucas and Carlos Martin Portugues Pontolier. Um, so in fact, we have two speakers for the next presentation. Francisco Lucas is an experimented bitumen and asphalt industry professional, and he is technical assistant and asphalt business development manager of Repsol. Francisco joined Repsol from Uruguay, Spain in 1999. And Francisco is a very active member in many associations and in many committees. Francisco is qualified, is a qualified civil engineer with a specialty in the roads from the Polytech University of Madrid. And he holds a master degree in management and administration. The second Presenter of the paper is Carlos Martin Portugues Montolieu, and he holds a degree in chemistry and he has more than 15 years' experience in research and development. 
Carlos is a former head of the Rota Research Group of the Technology Center of Asco the yeah, Acciona Construction, and he is currently the senior project manager of the new Roads and Environment Research Group, leading research projects on pavement, geotechnics, environment, and circular economy. Carlos has a wide experience in national and international collaboration collaborations for the European research area. Okay, the floor is now for our Spanish colleagues. Good afternoon. Thanks for the introduction, Egbert. I would like to present now the, the joint uh, work that we've performed together with uh, our colleagues from, from Repsol about uh, encapsulated agents uh, for self-healing asphalt. What is a self-healing asphalt? Uh, Self-healing as asphalt uh, is uh, a material that recovers the original properties, but uh, currently there are two clear trends in the market to, to deal with this particular uh, topic. Induction heating and uh, rejuvenation uh, agents that could be encapsulated or, or not. But the the work that we are here to to present is about the encapsulation of self healing agents in porous uh, aggregates so what we have developed is a, a new method for uh, impregnation and the porous uh, substrates with pure and emulsified uh, rejuvenators okay the process is quite quite simple is about the uh, impregnation, filtration, and drying to promote uh, additives and capsules that can be uh, suitable for blending with uh, normal asphalt concrete. So with this, with this technology, our colleagues from Repsol will explain about the impregnation capacity of, of this material. So Francisco, please go ahead. Uh, thank you, Carlo. And good afternoon. Uh, due to the encapsulation method was the vacuum impregnation, in the research project, we have studied the phenomenon using thermogravimetric analysis. In need, uh, four different substrates have been considered, and we have analyzed the impregnation capacity on the pure and emulsified regenerating agent. We can see how there is a reduction in the impregnation capacity if the rejuvenator does provide uh, via emulsion. Likewise, we observe uh, how the substrates that we have called one and two have the highest information capacity. In the next slides, uh, we analyze the diffusion of the rejuvenating agent in the different substrates by means of the FTIRRAPR diffusion test at 100 degrees which provide us uh, 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 with information about the percentage of absorption by the bituminous matrix of the rejuvenator at the indicated uh, temperature. It's not a test designed specifically for this type of material, but it seems appropriate to consider it. We see that for substrate three, the curve thing shows strange results, and that for substrate four, the diffusion in time is perfect. However, we have decided to stay in the analysis with substrates one and two, because although the method does not perfectly reflect diffusion, its high impersonation capacity has led us to choose them. Uh, in the next slide below, we show the effect of the capsules in the vitamins mixture, specifically in the choosing mixture has been a BBTM, 11b uh, we have chosen these mixtures because it is commonly used in the surface of spanish roads with significant traffic and contains a significant uh, number of voids that can somehow accelerate the natural aging of the mixture the results have been frankly good and the effect of the rejuvenating agents is uh, appreciated uh, we have taken a reference standard mix without regulators and subsequently, we have considered another mix 
which contains the same amount of regenerator uh, in green color as the substrates, but incorporated the little into the bitumen. In most of the sample tests, both the water sensitivity test and the wheel tracking test fell within the Spanish specification. Likewise, we want to see the behavior of the capsules without a regulator. Additionally, we have uh, calculated the stiffness modulus to measure the long-term behavior of the mixtures according to the ASTO R30 method at uh, 135 degrees during four hours and 85 degrees during five days, resulting in values consistent with the starting hypothesis and showing the proper behavior of regenerating uh, agents. Uh, to finalize this part of the mecha mechanical behavior of the mixture, we have applied the realm aging method for nine days at 135 degrees, which shows a reduction in aging of between about uh, 25 and 40 percent, depending on the type of substrate considered. To confirm these results provided by the stimulus mode, uh, we have carried out uh, the funny text developed by the Polytechnic University of Catalonia uh, in Spain for the performance characterization of bitumen mixtures, correlating the formation and resistance of the uh, uh, mixtures at different temperatures. And the results again show a behavior consistent with blends that contain regulators in capsules and those that don't have them. And in the last part, Carlos so us an experience, real experience in, in a road. Please, Carlos. Thanks for the for the good summary of the uh, laboratory results, Francisco. Uh, we have to say that in, in Acciona we 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 were happy with the joint uh, efforts uh, undertaken between Repsol the university and, and ACCIONA and uh, as we were happy with the result we decided to go for the scale up and uh, we uh, started we started the process to go for the first stretch uh, with this technology in, in Europe and we were lucky to count on the support of the of the client of this job site the Spanish Ministry of of Transport and in the A44 in Granada, in the south of, of, of Spain, we uh, decided to implement this technology and to go for the desired scale up of the technology. For that, we produced the, the capsules with a similar process uh, that we uh, used for the laboratory production. And uh, we used for the addition of the capsules to the to the asphalt, a normal uh, solid uh, dispenser that is typically used for the, the addition of fibers or lime for the production of uh, modified asphalt concrete. And the result was quite good. And uh, here you can find some details of the, of the job site. And uh, we count on the warm mix asphalt from uh, Repsol, and the result was quite good. We uh, undertake the normal quality control, and everything accomplished the regulation. So it, it was quite satisfactory, and also the the, the works were quite good uh, in terms of laying down and compaction without any any remark. So with that, we can conclude that the results uh, were expected and we are just waiting for the for the exposure to real environment and the, the real traffic uh, to verify that the good results at laboratory scale are confirmed at uh, under full scale uh, traffic and, and environment uh, exposure so conclusions uh, the technology developed in terms of uh, encapsulation is it's promising and the technology was validated and the pure rejuvenator was confirmed as a better uh, result compared with the emulsified one. 
The Ecamsolept method is simple, is scalable, and is competitive, as we demonstrated. The self-healing asphalt concrete performs fitable and according to the quality control uh, accomplished the regulation. The aging reduction was demonstrated at laboratory scale as Francisco described and the self-killing asphalt concrete production was normal and as well as the laying down compaction that was validated. We will monitor the, the road and we will verify that the aging uh, reduction is expected and the real environment and real traffic. So thanks for uh, attending. And if you have any comment or question, we will be happy to, to answer as you have our contact details. Thank you very much. Hello and Carlos, I uh, thank you both for your very nice presentation about the use and advantages of the rejuvenation capsules. Our next presentation is coming from the United States. Tobit Ur Araman will talk about the effect of Cape Seals on pavement structural performance. Tobit is a graduate research assistant at NCAT, the National Center of Asphalt Technology in Auburn, United States. In 2014, Tawita Rahman graduated from the Department of Civil Engineering at the Bangladesh University of Engineering and Technology called Buat with a major in transportation engineering. In 2016, he started his master's in civil engineering at the University of Minnesota in the United States. In 2017, Tawit got a fascination with asphalt pavements and that drove him to the National Center for Asphalt Technology, also known as NCAT, at the, Uni at the Auburn University in the United States. He joined as a research assistant for a pooled funded project by several DOTs in the United States. In 2019, he received his master's degree in civil engineering and now he is on the track of his PhD in research and is expected to graduate in 2021, so next year. So with the floor is yours. Hi everyone, uh, welcome to my presentation on the effect of capsules on pavement structural performance. I am MD Rahman and my co-author Dr. Arjuna Vargas is my PhD supervisor. Uh, we both work at National Center for Asphalt Technology and CAT at Auburn University, Auburn, Alabama, United States. Before we go over to the um, details, I would like to go over to the uh, little bit of background of the cave seal and pavement preservation. So the cave seal is the single layer of chip seal covered by a single or multiple layer of slurry seal or microsurface. Some of the functional benefits that are quantified are the smoother and denser pavement surface with high skip resistance. And the additional coating of slurry seal or microsurfacing eliminates the issues of loose stone chips. Based on the DOT experience and the literatures, we found out the average life extension is almost seven years. And uh, we already seen the functional benefits. We are yet to investigate if there is any structural benefit or not. So the objective is to investigate the structural contribution of Cape Seal for different traffic and weather conditions and uh, to observe the appropriateness of deflection basin parameters that we collect from the polymer deflectometer data, uh, if, if it has any structural health uh, contribution to the individual pavement layers. And the scope, we achieve the objective using the polymer deflectometer data from four test locations, collected periodically and analyzed. So the main road and cat partnership is one of the, uh, one of the few biggest uh, on-site full-scale testing facility for pavement performance. And uh, it has been uh, a BR project. It, it is for quantifying the uh, life extension benefit of the preservation treatments. We have four test locations, Leroy 159, US 280, SI8, and US 169. Among them, Leroy 159 and US 280 are from the warm model locations, if you see it from the laser. And the SI8 and US 169 is from the cold weather region from Minnesota. And Leroy 159, which was constructed in the summer of 2012. Uh, it represents the low traffic condition road. US 280 constructed in the summer of 2015 represents the high traffic volume road. CASA 8 and US 169 represents the low and high traffic volume road and both constructed in the summer of 2016. 
if you look at the structural uh, side of the payments, so the treated sections we found out on most of them have an equal or close uh, to six inch of asphalt concrete thickness, and uh, that was uniform for most of the uh, sections. But if you see a difference in the base layer, but to be noted, that's important to the notion that the parameters that you're using, the deflection basin parameters, uh, they consolidate uh, depend on the structural condition of the specific layer, not the thickness. Uh, so the difference in the base layer thicknesses doesn't affect the results of the outputs. We do a lot of testing on the test locations. Uh, among them, the polymer deflectometer testing has been adopted for the structural uh, analysis. And this is, we use the Dynatest 8000 device, which is capable of replicating 6 kip, 9 kip, and 12 kip load magnitudes. Testing frequency is also important parameter to be analyzed. Um, so we see, we have been collecting uh, the Leroy 159 US 280 southern location data on a quarterly basis. On the other hand, the CASA 8 and US 169 on the northern side, we got a chance to get uh, three uh, data points from each year because it has, it, it's a very cold and frigid winter and long time of uh, uh, the operation is stopped. So the deflection basin parameters that we analyze are today is the mean center deflection G0, which represents the overall pavement structure, the BPI, base damage index, which represents the base layer, the BCI, the base coverage index, which represents the subgrade, the area under pavement profile, AUPP, which represents the surface layer. The D represents the distance from the center of the load plate to the geophone that measuring the deflection. So this is, uh, this is a quick summary of what we saw from the different deflection basin parameters. So if you follow my leisure, you see the red dashes. So the red dashes are the Federal Highway Administration threshold for different parameters for it's different for D0, for BCI and BDI. So the red, uh, red dot means the poor condition. Meanwhile, the white dashes represents the warning condition. The red bars indicate the control sections for each test location. So we do have different control sections for different test locations. And the control sections indicate those sections who didn't receive any type of pretreatment or is not treated with any type of preservation treatment. Compared to the control uh, uh, capsule treated sections, we found out that D naught, BDN, and BCI value tend to remain lower at the present time than the control section. So for the Lee Road, it has been 77 months of service. Uh, for US 20, 39 months of service. For CASA 8 and US 169, we found out 26 months of service. So to this point, it's evident that the capsule drill sections are performing better structurally. So now we go over to the um, few details of the uh, duration of the study. So for year 159, we collected the data up to 77 months for US 20, 36 months. Uh, US 169 and CASA 8, we got data for 26 months. And uh, to achieve more uh, accurate uh, statistical analysis and focus models, uh, we are just limited uh, to uh, Leroy 159 outputs today because uh, we have 77 months of data that gave us more confidence for the results. So for the forecast, we use the ARIMA model. And if we see, uh, we did like 48 months of data for the training. After that, we started observing and we are at this point, 77 months of service. So these are the future points. These are the points that we already have in our model. And we also started seeing the field performance and the correlations between the field performance data and the um, model data that are pretty convincing. And the red cross line represents the control section. And what we see, uh, it should, the, based on the focus model, the control section should reach, uh, reach the uh, FSW warning zone after 77 months of service. And on the field, we also found it's already close to the warning zone. Meanwhile, the capsule title says sections don't seem to reach to the warning zone for the BDI values up to 220 months. Meanwhile, the focus for the BCI values for the capsule treated section is quite flat. And yes, uh, the subject condition isn't changing a lot, but the untreated or control section is anticipated to reach the um, threshold of warning zone in 130 months from uh, the start of operation. 
So the summary of the objectives, we see that DPPs indicate capsule treated sections uh, generally have lower uh, deflection distance parameters compared to the control section. Uh, the focus models don't predict capsules to reach the warning zone, uh, but the control section does. And capsules can extend the structure performance of the pavement. And if the data collection continues, we'll see some more of the similar analysis from the remaining of the dislocations. Here goes some of our sponsors. If you want to reach us uh, for any questions regarding our research or for some future uh, collaborations, we are always open to, for you kind suggestions and uh, reach us at our email address. Uh, we'll be more than happy to answer your questions. And thank you. Have a good day. Thank you, David, for your very nice presentation. And I wish you good luck with your PhD. Okay, we are now going to the last presentation of this session. This presentation is coming from Switzerland. Thomas Bandar will talk about maintenance of forest low noise pavements by large scale road grinding. So this is the second presentation about maintenance of porous asphalt. Tobias Baldwin grew up in Switzerland and after his study at the HTH in Zurich, he obtained his degree in he obtained his degree as materials engineer in 2003. He continued with his PhD in the field of physical chemistry and service forces studying nano confined fluids, followed by a two-year postdoc developing an optical biosensor until 2009. Then Tobias Palmer joined industry as a process development engineer in a mid-tech company. Since 2017, he is leading the R&D department at a Weibel AG in Bern with special focus on functional pavements, building material processing and recycling. Tobias, the floor is yours. Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to my talk. I will talk about the challenges of road noise mitigation in Switzerland and I will present our new approach of an acoustic maintenance procedure. I show you the characterization methods and results we gained on grinding depth, CPX measurements, and cross sectional images. In Switzerland, a so called semi dense Asphalt, SDA, with a typical maximum grain size of four or eight millimeters is used uh, at locations where needed. This mixture has been developed and introduced about a decade ago, and today an increasing number of sections are built every year. In this plot, you can see the grading curve of an SDA4. As the name suggests, it's a compromise between dense and porous asphalt. A compromise that seeks for an optimum lifetime and an excellent acoustic properties known from open graded asphalt. In Switzerland, we use a model called the SDA86 plus model to calculate street noise emissions. And the close proximity method is used to measure the acoustic quality of the road. The values are always expressed in minus decibel compared to the model. If, for example, a road has minus one decibel at the end of its lifetime, it's considered as a low noise pavement. But in most cases, a minimum of minus three decibel at end of lifetime is required. The intention of SDA mix design was to use small grain with small pores that would provide acoustic favorable surface texture. And it was also believed that the tiny hydrophobic pores would be prevented from clogging over time. Unfortunately, reality is a little bit worse. In this plot on the right, you see the course of acoustic aging of two roads, SDA4, with 12 and 16 voids in comparison. During the first year, we gain from the higher void content with a better acoustic value. After, in the sixth year, both roads drop below the minus three margin. In the beginning, that acoustic aging is mainly due to clogging of pores. And in the SDA, this happens in the upper layer which can readily be seen from cross-sectional images. It is important to notice that there's a different clogging mechanism for SDA than, for example, for regular porous asphalt, where the clogging normally occurs bottom up. It was tried with, with water cleaning and high pressure and suction to avoid this clogging, however, without success. In the later part of lifetime, oxidation and weathering of the bitumen sets in and also grain loss occurs. 
which attributes to additional vibrational noise. Optimization of the recipe so far only helped to improve acoustics after laying, but not to prevent grain loss or cracking over long term. Our new approach is to use surface grinding technique to regenerate the acoustic properties of existing and edge pavements. By grinding off a few millimeters from the surface, we intend to restore the macro texture and possibly also to activate access again to underlying yet unclogged pores. Our focus was also to prove that we can do this at large scale in economic manner. We used a special grinding vehicle that is equipped with five grinding heads at its front and behind there is a fine layer of debris which needs to be cleaned off. This can be done with regular street cleaning machine, with dry brush cleaning and the second machine with water jet and suction for final clean. The whole convoy with a length of about 80 meters was able to process one kilometer and two lanes in one day. On this slide, I show you an overview of the two test sections I'm talking about today. The first one in the town of Roma with a length of 500 meters in an industrial district, rather high traffic. The second one in the village of Gorsere, 700 meters in length, less traffic, but much more agricultural activity, which usually contributes to the clogging. After successful pre-tests in two, two times 20 meters zones in April 2018, we processed the entire road in November 2018 and the total of 8,000 square meters in two days. Besides the CPX acoustic measurements after grinding, the main interest also lied in determining the actual grinding depth. With a simple method, we measured cross profiles uh, across the street lane and with difference before and after grinding, we calculate the mean grinding depth at resolution of about one millimeter. By visual inspection of the surface texture, we looked for signs of reopened pore. Further analysis we used was cross-sectional images from impregnated core samples. With this special method, the top layer from, from the core was impregnated with two colors, first one from top and the second one from bottom. The penetration depth of the resin from top, in this case, the red color, provides information on accessibility to the open pores. Now let's have a look at the results from the two roads. In this table, we can compare the values from the pre-test zones and the large scale test sections for each road, Homo and top and Gorsere at the bottom. In the pre-test, we also varied the grinding depth, which we did by multiple grinding passages of the machine. In Romo, the highest depth was four to seven millimeters, and in Gorsere, we achieved nine to 12 millimeters. The acoustic gain was then measured about 10 days after grinding, and is given in the table separately for car and for truck tire. In all cases, we achieved a positive result, meaning that the road became more quiet, as it is seen by the negative sign of the gain values. Highest gains of up to minus five decibel were achieved with high grinding depth on the SDA. But also in the large scale test sections with grinding depth of only one to three millimeters, we still achieved minus three decibel gain. To put this in relation, a decrease of three decibel is usually equivalent of reduction of about half of the traffic volume. To explain the high gains at increased grinding depth, we now look at a set of cross sectional images from drill core. Uh, taken in zone two with a grinding depth of four to seven millimeters in Romo and bottom row um, drill cores at grinding depth nine to 12 millimeters in Gorsere. The first image was taken as a reference without grinding, the second one immediately after grinding, and the third one 12 months later. It is seen from the reference that no penetration from the raising from top occurs, meaning that the pores were fully clogged. Afterwards, after grinding, there's a significant difference that now the raising applied from top penetrates the porous network. We can conclude that the high gains of up to minus five decibel are due to re-established access to the pores. After 12 months, partial reclogging occurs, which is observed by the somewhat decreasing penetration depth of the raising. In this case, it's now the red color. The measured gains of three to five decibel 
can definitely be considered as a high acoustic benefit, but the big question is how long will it last? Here in this plot, I show you the acoustic course of the two roads over time at, with age, and this time the CPX values with 10% drug content are given. At age seven in Romo and age six in Corsere, the grinding took place, and with an effect of minus three decibel, we are clearly again below the minus three decibel margin. In the first year, we observed a loss of 30 to 50% of the initial gain. In the second year, this decay decreased, and we still measured one to two decibel of remaining effect from grinding compared to the level before, still below or close the three decibel margin. With this, I come to my Summary and conclusions, I showed you that large-scale grinding for acoustic maintenance of edge road sections of up to one kilometer per working day is feasible. For SDI-4, the acoustic gain depends on grinding depth. With little grinding of one to three millimeters, we obtained already three decibel. This effect is dominated by improved macro texture. With larger grinding depth in the range of four to 12 millimeters, we gained up to five decibel. And the additional effect is due to regeneration of open pores. From acoustic point of view, our new maintenance procedure can be considered as useful. Whether it will be used or not depends on further monitoring data. Today, I can say that with the positive effect remains for at least two years. And from extrapolation of the decay, we can estimate about four years of acoustic benefit for the road owners. Thank you very much for your attention. Tobias, I thank you very much for your presentation. Now we are going to the Q&A part of the second session. And I think we better start with the questions for Carlos because we got a lot of questions. Hey, Carlos, um, the main questions were in fact regarding the aggregate you use for your rejuvenator. A lot of people were wondering whether that porous material wouldn't degrade during production, paving, and compaction. And well, I, to be honest, I, I had the same question. Okay. Yeah, it's, it's a, a question that was also in our mind when we uh, uh, scale up this technology. So the, the, the answer was quite simple. The, the, we did uh, an initial trial just uh, using the capsules and following the same uh, normal production or in the, in the asphalt concrete plant. And we just checked the, the result after the mixing. So the capsule, capsules were okay. So the, the first part was quite clear and the, the, the production of the asphalt concrete will not affect the, the, the captures and it was like that. And uh, on the other hand, for the laying down and compaction, uh, what we did was to, uh, to follow the same, the normal procedure for, for uh, building roads. And then we struck the specimens, cut the specimens into, and check the, how is the, the, the blending and how was the homogeneity of the, of the specimen. And in checking with the, with the thermal, uh, thermographic camera, you can see some uh, differences between the, the capsules and the normal aggregates and the asphalt. So that's where we, where we noticed that there was no uh, uh, effect on the, on the capsules due to the manufacturing and the laying down and compaction. Okay, and then there's a question of Eric Jorda, and he is wondering how do you control the release of the rejuvenator when it is needed, and the amount released? Yeah, that's the one million question. <laughs> that's <laughs> that's quite difficult to to answer at this at this stage. Okay, and the plan that we have is. Uh, considering the results that we achieved during the laboratory uh, scale phase, okay, where we uh, did different uh, tests on the uh, dynamic modules, okay, uh, we uh, identified variations of of the module due to due to the uh, amount of of rejuvenator in the in the mixture. And what we will do is just to monitor a long time the, the, 
test section and uh, as as we see the evolution of the of the module we will see if there was a, a release of the rejuvenator or not because there is a, a, a reference section just in the, the the next section of the road is a normal asphalt concrete and we will see the differences under the same conditions and the same traffic so that's why how we intend to to verify the release of the rejuvenator a long time okay thank you then there's also another question it's from katarzyna Konitsna, uh, and she says, uh, what is the amount of capsules you are using in the mix? And have you examined in the lab the possible improvement in the mixture's fatigue life due to the use of the encapsulated rejuvenators? Okay, well, the, the amount of, cap of capsules was 1% uh, uh, by weight in the total asphalt concrete uh, mixture. And uh, concerning the resistance to fatigue improvement, it was uh, verified at a lot of laboratory scale. And also, as it was included in the presentation, uh, due to the aging test, because uh, after performing the RILEM and the SHRP uh, aging test, we noticed that the, the fatigue was uh, slightly better with this, uh, with this uh, technology. Okay, thank you. Um, then I suggest uh, to go to Toit um, for this presentation. Toit, in your conclusions, you mentioned that the Cape Seals were also found effective in delaying the development of bottom-up fatigue cracking by minimizing the tensile strain at the bottom of the asphalt concrete layer. And I guess uh, it, it's based on the forecasted AUPP, what is called the, the area under the pavement profile in the ARIMA model. And I'm, I'm wondering, does it mean that the Cape Seal adds strength to the building capacity of the pavement due to the increase of the total asphalt concrete pavement thickness? Or what is the, the reason of the increase? Okay, or so uh, I would say like is the bottom line is that pavement preservation treatments they don't add to the structural capacity but they delay the loss of the structural capacity so whenever you are applying something on the uh, top layer uh, you know like it got a amount of um, structural capacity and with time it will go away but what the preservation treatments does or the capsule does is that seals the top layer and doesn't let the weathering effect or the water in. And by this way, it delays the aging. It's, it's like an indirect approach of handling the things. Yeah, yeah in fact, you mean that you, you, you keep the, the, the service sealed and due to the seal, in fact, you have a longer service life. Exactly. So it okay. stays at its ease, as it is. So this is why we okay. call them preservation. Good. Okay, thank you. Um, yeah, then uh, Tobias, we also had um, some some questions uh, from you. Um, there were several. Um, yeah, the uh, Finn Guam said, uh, just curious whether the grinding procedures create more dust and will the dust increase the clogging instead of uh, opening the, the pores? Yes, that was actually one of the major concerns in the beginning and indeed we did the initial pre-test I talked about on the small scale, we did in a dry process, which however produced a lot of dust and then we recognized that we need to uh, change it and for the large scale we used uh, water spraying for binding the dust. Um, up to now, uh, considering that you have the, the right cleaning process, we believe that uh, it's, it's possible to prevent a, a reclogging right after the process, but it's, it's definitely crucial to, to look uh, to the way you clean. Okay. Um, then we have a question from Diao Alfonso, and he says, which material or 
color resin was used to check the poor interconnection? Uh, that was an epoxy resin, which was uh, just um, colored with, with a fluorescent dye in two colors. So it can okay. be applied in a liquid and then it dries out, hardens, and then uh, the cross section is made and looked at under ultraviolet light. Um, Gerbe van Bokhoven asks, what about the effect of grinding on the lifetime of the pavement? Uh, yes, that's, we, we tried to find the optimal point where we can profit from the, the grinding effect towards end of lifetime. Now, the, the examples I gave you were grinded in the six and seven years, and at about 10 years, we, we expect the end of the mechanical lifetime. So from the further monitoring, we will know if there's still something left. Um, as it looks now, it will be tough to reach the, the, the minus three decibel margin, but it, it could be well possible that you still have some effect from the grinding if you compare it to, to a non grinded uh, area. So some of the concept could also be that if, if we don't grind a lot and gain three decibel, that possibly the, the procedure could also be repeated in case of a, in case of longer mechanical lifetime of the pavement. Okay. Tobias, I thank you very much. Um, colleagues, uh, we have to, to close this session because uh, it's almost eight or almost six o'clock and we need to give the people some time to change from channel, from this channel to the other channel for the closing session that will start at eight o'clock sharp. I would like to thank all the speakers for their very interesting presentations. Uh, of course, uh, it was virtual and not in reality, but I hope to see each other again in the, the next conference. You all had uh, interesting presentations, various techniques were presented regarding maintenance and re rehabilitation of pavements. I also would like to thank all the people that joined us and that joined the EED Congress here in 2021, which was held as a virtual one. Okay, I thank you all for being here and I wish you a good future. Thank you, bye-bye and take care. Thank you, goodbye. Thank you.